This is quite a gathering of democracy experts, activists, and advocates. And that is wholly fitting because we are here to honor quite a man. We chose to call this event, which is devoted to the legacy of Nobel laureate Lu Xiaobo, a memorial symposium. And yes, it's a memorial, a solemn reflection and deep tribute to a man who was denied proper medical treatment and who died while held captive under authoritarian control. We could express our sadness and even our anger about that. But through this symposium, we are channeling our shared feelings into a level of engagement with the forces of repression that Lu Xiaobo would approve. We are taking heart by thinking through his words and his deeds. The symposium aspect of today's event means the intellectual discussion that we will be having with our speakers. The sim part comes from the Greek word for together. It's like the word symphony. Lu Xiaobo did more to forge harmony across Asia and throughout the world in support of democratic values and human rights than any other individual since the beginning of this new millennium. And that's according to Ned's president, Carl Gershman, who truly feels the impact of this hero of democracy. Carl, along with the members of our distinguished panel, will elaborate on the significance of Lu Xiaobo as each provides their own perspective on his daunting struggles and magnificent triumphs. By reflecting together on Lu Xiaobo's legacy, we find a unity of purpose in defending freedom, in liberating minds, and protecting fundamental human rights. I'm pleased to tell you that in parallel with this event, in Taipei, a commemorative event honoring Lu Xiaobo was held five hours ago. They are 12 hours ahead of us. The Taiwan Foundation for Democracy specifically asked that we mention their own tribute this day, which was organized to resonate in harmony with this memorial symposium hosted by the National Endowment for Democracy. Together, we draw strength and inspiration to embrace the freedoms boldly championed by Lu Xiaobo, a man who, before his sentencing in 2009, stood before the court and declared, to block freedom of speech is to trample on human rights, to strangle humanity, and to suppress the truth. The Taiwan Foundation for Democracy requested and was granted a video message from Ned's president, Carl, as a sign of our solidarity and shared commitment to democratic values. In the video, Carl retraces Lu Xiaobo's life and its meaning, recognizing him as a hero of truth, and in so doing, affirming our common humanity and the universality of our essential mission. Many of you probably know that each year the NED honors democracy activists from around the world with a sculpture. It's quite beautiful. Modeled to represent the goddess of democracy that was constructed out of foam and paper mache on a metal frame that rose 33 feet tall over the student protesters assembled on Tiananmen Square in May 1989. When the statue was unveiled, they burst into cheers, shouting, long live democracy. That statue would be destroyed by soldiers armed with rifles and tanks, along with massive numbers of demonstrators also destroyed. Lu Xiaobo was there on the scene, trying to save as many as he could. And then he was imprisoned for siding with the students. When he got out, Instead of abandoning the cause of freedom, he went back to pushing for democratic reforms, driven, his friends said, by anger and guilt over the students who had been killed. We know what this man was able to accomplish by channeling, channeling those feelings 
into powerful words and courageous actions. That is what we are memorializing and celebrating here today. Again, we at NED welcome you all. We thank you for your appreciation for a great man and your devotion to a great cause. It's my honor now to turn over the symposium to our moderator, Carl Gershman. Thank you so much, Judy, for those wonderful remarks. Um, I want to thank you for your leadership. And I also want to second your thanks to our friends in Taiwan and at, at the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, which is a partner, in, the only partner institution, real partner institution in Asia, for joining us in this celebration of Liu Xiaobo's life. His contribution to democracy was monumental, and his analysis of Chinese politics and society and his warning about the danger to the world of a rising and di still dictatorial China remain profoundly relevant today. We couldn't share Liu Xiaobo's suffering, but we can try to understand his ideas, appreciate his example, and find inspiration in his vision of a different China. I'm very grateful for every, to everyone for coming today. Our speakers were all connected to Liu Xiaobo in one way or another. On Andy Nathan's good advice, we decided that we won't try to have a common discussion on the issue of wither China, even though that's suggested in the title, which he worried might produce a monotonous recitation of overlapping assessments that would be exhortatory because of the nature of the occasion, yet still inconclusive, as inevitably they are when discussing the future of China. Rather, we'll try to talk around the same kinds of issues by posing the questions differently. In keeping with this approach, we have asked Ned's, in this order, Ned's Luisa Griva, who has devoted her life to the study and democratization of China, to speak about Ned's relationship with Liu and what the lessons of his struggle are for the wider global mission of aiding democracy. After Louisa, we'll hear from Perry Link, who needs no introduction to this audience and who produced this splendid uh, collection of Liu Xiaobo's writings entitled Liu Xiaobo, No Enemies, No Hatred, which he edited with Tenchi Martin Lao and Liu Jia, Liu Xiaobo's widow, who is in our prayers today. Perry will talk about Lu Xiaobo as a personality, how that personality evolved under the impact of a set of personal experiences, and how that evolution affected the shape and the strategy of his struggle. Next, we'll hear from Xiao Chang, who is the founder and the editor-in-chief of China Digital Times, who will talk about the reception of Liu in the Chinese public, the struggle over censorship, what image of Liu was projected in China, and how different sectors view or don't view him. He follows all of, the, all of what's being produced on the internet in China. After Xiao, we'll hear from Li Xiaorong, who introduced many of us to the Charter 08 Democracy Manifesto, of which Liu Xiaobo was the principal author, at a strategy meeting on China that we held here at NED just days after uh, Charter 08 was adopted in December of 2008. She has continued to stay connected to the democracy movement in China and to help NED stay connected. Xiaorong will talk about how those who struggle for democracy in China see the road ahead. Not so much to predict whether China will change or not, but as somebody who has been committed to that change and why she thinks the strategies that she and her circle have pursued and which are the strategies that Liu Xiaobo pursued have been correct despite all the setbacks. And finally, we'll hear from Andy himself, 
the perpetual ambivalent skeptic <laughs> who understands China so well that he's always cautioning against confident predictions yet who also stays connected to the struggle and in his own unique way inspires hope. Andy will speak about what the regime's counter response to Liu and to other democracy advocates shows about the regime's strengths and weaknesses and about its strategies to deal with dissent. He may also mention other exemplary people like Xu Jiang who form the broader context of Liu's activities. I look forward to a memorable discussion and exchange of views, and I'm sure we'll have time for questions from the audience. If you haven't turned off your cell phone, please do so now, and you can join the discussion on Twitter by following our handle at NEDemocracy or hashtag NEDEvents. And now, Luisa. The struggle of man against power, it has been famously said, is the struggle of memory against forgetting. We're here today to remember Liu Xiaobo and understand his legacy, and this is a profoundly important and significant contribution to that struggle for memory against forgetting. For an, over two millennia, each new Chinese dynasty rewrote the history of the last, George Orwell wrote in 1944, the really frightening thing about totalitarianism is not that it commits atrocities, but that it attacks the concept of objective truth. It claims to control the past as well as the future. Orwell does end his essay on a more hopeful note with a, a brave hope. He says, the liberal habit of mind, which thinks of truth as something outside yourself, something to be discovered, and not as something you can make up as you go along, will survive. And long after the last dynasty in China and after the end of the 20th century, century totalitarianism understood by Milan Kundera and Orwell, still in 2010, we saw an empty chair at Liu Xiaobo's Nobel Prize ceremony. This reflects the authoritarian power that is exercised over history and remembrance in the China of our time. And Liu Xiaobo took this as a vocation. He sought to remember the whole truth about China that the Ch Communist Party, Party so proudly was so proudly claiming to have built. Everyone remembers the famous line. It was in 1943, before the party came to power, when the Liberation Daily issued its editorial entitled Without the Communist Party, there would be no new China. And soon afterwards, a propaganda song was composed according, uh, under this title. Later on, Mao uh, changed the title and thus created the phrase that every Chinese citizen has heard thousands upon thousands of times uh, in his or her lifetime. Without the Communist Party, there would be no new China. And while Mao mercifully died in 1976, already three generations ago. The party in this generation uh, is attempting to recapture the energy of that kind of propaganda urge. Uh, and in fact, 10 years ago in 20, 2006, a gigantic memorial in honor of this song was opened in a suburb of Beijing. And as we move forward to the present day, the current leader of China is bringing forward loyalty oaths for school children and university professors alike. The new textbooks for the fall term of school in both elementary and middle school has a completely new curriculum emphasizing socialist education in every lesson. We know that religious leaders, imams in every mosque in China are required to sign a letter pledging their loyalty to the state. Liu Xiaobo steadfastly refused to participate in the party's version of history and reality. He was among the most confident advocates for a more humane world in all of Chinese literature and social commentary, for lives of dignity and authenticity, 
for people from all walks of life. Of the power of writing, his um, first career, he said to a friend in 2000, the beauty of written language is that in the dark, it sheds a light on truth. And beauty is the focal point of truth. He was thrilled when the internet came to China. He said, it's like a magic engine. Uh, talking about the period of the 1990s after his release from that first uh, term in prison. In fact, he says, it has helped my writing erupt like a geyser. I can even live on what I write. Uh, and when he expressed his enthusiasm, he was calling it even God's gift to China. And he was truly present for a while, from 1992 when he was released until his detention in 2008. Uh, by one calculation, he was able to publish one of more than a thousand articles promoting humanitarianism and democracy on Chinese language websites, not in China, where everything was controlled, but on in journals and websites based outside China. And NED is proud to have supported many of those journals, was able to pay uh, writer's fees for those who wrote. And Liu was able to, in this way, write uh, not only what used to be called desk drawer essays, expressing one's views, but having to put it away in a desk drawer with no way to reach audiences. In fact, uh, he could he reached millions through the internet, both in China and abroad. And along with that avenue for freedom of, of expression, of course, comes a certain discipline. There has to be a demand side. Who is the audience? Or is anyone out there reading? You have to understand the concerns and worries of an audience um, when you're writing for one. And even more fundamentally, you have to build and nurture that audience. If the audience is, is people in China who've lived under conditions of authoritarian control and education, how do you nurture an au that audience to come along to a new way of thinking? when the entire power of the modern authoritarian state has been geared towards molding the minds of the young, engineering every psychological and material incentive to herd people along in one of two paths, harmless entertainment or individuality through consumer uh, delights, or active loyal conformity to the state's demands. Under this dual system, whatever genuinely independent individualities can s survive, the iron fist of this organized system is intended to brutally crush those voices, as it has done to our hero, Liu Xiaobo. So Liu Xiaobo's detention in 20, 2008 very nearly coincides with the beginnings of what we at NED are calling the authoritarian resurgence. One of its tools is the use by these regimes in their newfound confidence to use the internet as a tool, as an instrument of broad surveillance, high-tech surveillance, and of propaganda to further mold minds. Communication technology, in this sense, is not only a, an arena for censorship, but to actively push propaganda even fake news. And for China in particular, Liu was always worried about this. He said, the unrelenting inculcation of Chinese Communist Party ideology has produced generations of people whose memories are blank. But Liu also recognized that communication of ideas alone, from activists to followers, or among people who are thinking and developing new ideas, cannot go as far as it should without what we call intermediating institutions. So he was not only a critic and an intellectual, bringing forward the ideas that can inspire people, not only serving as a, a voice of conscience, and not only providing his example of exceptional moral courage, he also created a legacy of flesh and blood human beings. They were inspired him, by him, but they were also shaped and molded by the experience of working together to build ideas, build institutions, and work on crap practical problems. So I'd like to say a word about the significance of two of those institutions that uh, Liu Xiaobo worked on very intensively from the mid-2000s until his detention uh, in 2008 and 
NED was very proud to be a longtime supporter of both those institutions. The first one is Democratic China Magazine, Minju Zhongguo. When he became uh, editor in 2006, it was not to be a, an editor of a literary magazine, which had been his early career. It was Minju Zhongguo has, has a different mission. The mission is to quote, to explore and foster freedom, democracy, human rights, the rule of law, and constitutionalism. These are not the stuff of literary imagination, first and foremost, but rather the practical problems of politics and governance. He entered a new arena where he knew the attention of China's acute social critics needed to be turned. In that, inside that institution, he also shaped a strong ethical foundation for the practices of, of running an institution. Editorial board members were no longer uh, allowed to receive fees for the articles that they wrote. He used the platform also especially to cultivate the next generation, to bring along new writers, he was continued, in fact, his role as a teacher, a salon leader, and used this platform to encourage all kinds of writers to come forward, develop their insight, develop an audience, and engage with one another. The second institution is the Independent Chinese Pen Center, Du Li Bi Hui, the first and still only membership organization of writers and journalists who are dedicated to championing, quite simply, freedom of expression in China. He, he, in this endeavor as well, he cultivated the next generation. He was very influential in persuading additional writers to join. With all that effort, it's still a very small organization in the situation of uh, the repression people face in China. At its peak, I believe the membership was just over 160 people, brave individuals. And then inside the institution, Liu Xiaobo was a great builder of an institution that can last. He insisted that every board member faithfully observe the ethical standards of the institution. He dealt with countless difficulties in trying to have co several co-editors of a magazine, two of which were inside China, two of which were outside China. Imagine editing a magazine across continents, 12 hours difference, without free communications. All of these standards that he set were in stark contrast to the culture in which they were swimming, where China developed a political culture of egotism and competition, a larger sea of unrelenting corruption, venality, and brutality, and the corresponding habits of censorship and self-censorship. And in both these endeavors, Liu Xiaobo did more than that. He was a great leader uh, in providing humanitarian assistance. Independent Pen, in fact, in its own structure, its committees, it devotes much of its energy and even financial resources to helping those in need. Freedom to write fellowships for people who have lost their jobs. Humanitarian assistance to the families of people, of political prisoners, those writers who languished in prison as prisoners of conscience. And there, too, he insisted on a properly run organization. Board meetings would uh, go according to rules. There would be proper ground rules for the elections. There would be rotation as office. Uh, Liu Xiaobo stepped down after two terms as president of Independent China, P Chinese Penn Center, even though all the members would have elected him by acclamation. But he said, that's not in the bylaws. We need new leaders. And even outside leading these two institutions simultaneously and writing his many, many hundreds of articles during this time, he actually received a constant stream of visitors to his apartment, people bringing their tales of injustice, problems that they saw. And he himself personally spent countless hours and often his own money connecting people who are facing problems with people who might be willing to help them, with lawyers, with journalists, with documentary filmmakers, and other writers. So here we see Liu Xiaobo's career as both a thinker and a writer and also an activist. And he excelled at all of these vocations. And like no one else, he made them into the truly exceptional life that is uh, honored around the world. But he built all of this, I think, into a program that will last. Now, he's a hero. 
but he recognized that not everyone can do everything. Uh, not everyone can be a hero or wants to be a hero. So most people are not acute social critics, but what can they do? They can look around and note when something is wrong. Most people are not prolific writers, but they can institute ethical rules in the institutions that they run. Most people may not have name recognition, but they can still cultivate the next generation in what they do, no matter how small that garden may be. And most people live under conditions of great stress and personal difficulties, pressure and stress, and they don't have the extraordinary courage of somebody like Liu Xiaobo, but they can take the time to pay respects to the dead and to be personally generous to others in time of need. So in this way, Liu Xiaobo's example uh, is not only something to be aspired to by those who can reach the great heights of being a hero of democracy, but all of us, Chinese Democrats, also those struggling for democracy everywhere in the world. What does he teach us? He teaches us to think and speak and write even under conditions of censorship and deprivation, even when you may not be able to publish or we have a very tiny audience, even when you fear nobody is listening. Do it anyway. He teaches us to think about the act of remembering the dead, especially those who have lost their lives in the service of good causes. That alone is an act of resistance and of conscience. He teaches us to seek knowledge, not the education decreed by the powers of the day. Uh, Simone Leys, in writing about Leo, pointed out that, um, as people may know, Leo Xiaobo spent a decade as a sent down youth. When the schools were closed, he had to work on a farm like most people of his generation. But in retrospect, Liu said um, he, appreciated, he appreciated losing out on those years of schooling till, during the Cultural Revolution. Why? Because those years of lost schooling allowed me freedom. And by Liu's example of his many turns, writing articles as an investigator and as a documentarian regarding an extraordinary range of issues in contemporary China, he also teaches us to pay attention to what's happening around us, um, to regard no matter of social importance as beneath our notice or beyond our ability to recognize or act upon. He strongly believed also that a true civic movement could be formed in China despite the generations or perhaps centuries of authoritarian conditioning that he so acutely recognized and, and diagnosed, the hatred, the cynicism, the hypocrisy, the habits of cruelty toward others, purely for one's own survival. And I want to mention two, th two facts about Liu Xiaobo's uh, wishes for his Nobel Prize ceremony that really illustrate the importance that he placed on thinking of this work as a generational struggle. First, he dedicated the prize to those who died on June 4th in Tiananmen Square. And secondly, as he told Liu Xia, when she was his wife Liu Xia, when she was able to visit him, that he wanted children to participate in that ceremony. And indeed, the Norwegian Children's Choir sang songs uh, at that ceremony. Now, the quotation with which I started is from Milan Kundera's book of Laughter and Forgetting. I'm sure everyone recognizes it. And here, the Known fact, at the founding of the Czech Republic, um, the leaders appear on a balcony, and then in the picture that generations of ch school children received, a solicitous comrade, Clementus, puts a cap on the chief's head, Gottwald, in the freezing rain and snow. Four years later, Clementus was hanged for treason, airbrushed out, and we know that all that remains of Clementus was the cap on Gottwald's head. So it may be that for a while, the Chinese state will largely succeed in er disappearing the memory of Liu Xiaobo into the black hole of amnesia, which he himself did so much to fight. But our memorials today here and in Taipei, also that have been occurring, memorial tributes all over the world, in London, in Malmo. Um, we have with us today some people who were there. Um, Liu Xiaobo's fellow editors of Ju Democratic China are here, and I thank you for attending. Oslo, New York, and elsewhere. By conducting these memorials, we are at least providing a foundation of a guarantee that the amnesia will not be complete. We've done our part to put that cap on Gottwald's head, a cap that will serve as a signpost and an archaeological clue, telling future Chinese generations where to look for the next chapter of the story. Thank you.
Thank you, Louisa. Uh, we're going to now hear from Perry. And those people who are standing in the back, you're welcome to come up. We have about 10 seats here in the front if you want to come up to the front. Perry. Uh, I, too, would like to begin by thanking Judy and Carl and NED for having this event and coordinating it with Taiwan. I wish it were much bigger and all around the world. Um, Liu Xiaobo is known to his friends recently as the Iron Man of Democracy, primarily because for his whole life he told the truth as he saw it. He seems to have had a gene for that almost. Uh, but I don't think we should do hagiography. Uh, he struggled through his life with internal struggles and between him and his environment. And the story of his heroism, in my view, is how he could look at his own life and correct mistakes and regret and overcome them and then became a Iron Man of democracy. This kind of view, I think, is not only more accurate, but gives us a deeper sense of uh, how he came to be the wonderful person he was. So I want to talk about his early years a bit. His father was a early Communist Party member, joined the revolution in 41, and later was a professor of ling linguistics at Dongbei Shifandashe, where Liu Xiaobo grew up in a fairly privileged, uh, almost red commune, uh, not commune, courtyard. Um, and this, I think, gave him a very early confidence in what he could go out and do. We have to explain his ability to, to speak out and rush forth. The family, as many in China, went through some tough times during the Great Leap Forward. His father, he tells us, was very stern and used to beat him up uh, severely. He didn't like his father. He loved his grandmother, who was sort of the good cop in the good cop, bad cop household for him. Uh, he was a rebellious kid, the third of five brothers, no sisters in the family, uh, who distinguished himself by taking up smoking at age 11 to defy his parents and to defy his school authorities. And he has an essay later where he said, taking up smoking involved me necessarily in both lying and theft. I had to lie about where I got the cigarettes and I stole from my father in order to buy them because they're expensive. His primary school teacher, he said, was too simple-minded. He did great in uh, elementary school, but criticized his teacher. When the Cultural Revolution came, 66 to 69, he was in Changchun. Still, he was born and grew up in Changchun. And he saw, he was merely 11 to 14 years old, so he wasn't quite an activist Red Guard, but he saw raids and violence up and down the main street of Changchun. And he and his pre-adolescent friends roved around the city picking on people. He has a wonderful essay about picking on this old beggar who was sorting through garbage in order to, to make a living and how he later regrets it. This is what I mean by the inner struggles and overcoming himself. But he was very much in the mouthing at the time. Um, he wrote an essay in 2003 30 years later, looking back and regretting. I'll read you a quote from it. Mao-style thinking and cultural revolution-style language had become ingrained in me, and my goal had been to transform myself from the bone marrow out. Ha! Easier said than done. It might take me a lifetime to get rid of that poison. In 69, he and his family were sent to Inner Mongolia, which was a much more boring regimented but boring environment. He started reading. He couldn't go to school, but he began a lifetime attachment to reading. And later, if you look at this book, you can see how voraciously he read all kinds of uh, ancient and modern Chinese literature and ancient and modern Western literature. I was really shocked when I edited this book at how broad his erudition was. Um, he began out in the countryside a teenage romance with a uh, woman named Tao Li, who'd come from the same courtyard in uh, Changchun as he did. She, her parents were also professors, and they were all sent out at the same time. But at the time, it was forbidden to tan lian ai in China, so they did this surreptitiously. But then when they came back to Beijing, uh, he 
they married in 1982. Uh, from 1982 to 84, he was at Beijing Normal University doing an MA on ancient Chinese literature, which was a topic uh, originally assigned to him. He didn't choose it. And he was assigned a uh, advisor whom he didn't get along with. The advisor would write notes in his margins, and he would write back that, I didn't write those words. They're not mine. Go away. And the advisor died, and he went to the funeral and didn't bow. This was a big uh, early sign of rebellion as well. He was smitten, though, by in his study of ancient China with Zhuangzi, the famous inventor of semi-mystical conundrums. And this, uh, I'll speak in a moment, led into a later phase in his development. Uh, 84 to 86, he was kept at the Beijing Normal University as a lecturer. And then he wrote a PhD dissertation. He worked on a PhD from 86 to 88. His dissertation was called Aesthetics and Human Freedom. And the story of why he settled on aesthetics is interesting. He was in the generation who grew up with scar literature and the thaw after Mao. And he and other young people were optimistic about more freedom in politics, the economy, society, religion, and all those things. But then one by one, the government came along with its campaigns, the strike hard campaign, the anti-bourgeois liberalism campaign, and the anti jing shen uh, uh, spiritual pollution campaign. And this was debilitating to their spirits. And they realized all these spheres of politics, economy, society, religion were closed off, but not aesthetics. It was the one place where he could still seek to be his own person entirely. And that's why he wrote about aesthetics. In 1986, when he was still a grad student, there was a big conference in Beijing called Chinese Literature in the New Era that he went to as a mere grad student and became famous <coughs> almost overnight <coughs> because he freely denounced everybody in sight, all the party connected writers, but also what he viewed as the new mandarinate, mandarinate of uh, the reform culture people, especially Liu Zaifu, the wonderful senior literary critic. He denounced uh, Liu Zaifu and others. He wrote this sentence, I can sum up what's wrong with Chinese writers in one sentence. They can't write creatively themselves. They simply don't have the ability because their very lives don't belong to them. His mantra at the time was individualism, be my true self. Later, he apologized to Liu Zaifu, and we've confirmed this with Liu Zaifu. He went to Liu Zaifu and said, sorry, I had to denounce you. It was the only way I could get famous. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, for this, he got the moniker of the black horse on the literary scene, the Heima. Uh, he, meanwhile, I said, was married to Tao Li, but he wasn't very good to her. Starting in 86, he used to look for other women and had girlfriends, one of whom, but just very subtly, was Liu Xia. At the time, Liu Xia was also married at the time to a literary editor named Wu Bin. <coughs> We come to 1989, though, and there'll be more talk about that, which he called in his final statement at his trial, the major turning point in my life. Not because it was the pinnacle of his rebellious audacity, but almost the reverse. Just before he came back to Tiananmen, he'd taken a trip to Oslo and then to New York, and at a visit at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, he sort of had a kind of a youthful epiphany where he realized that the problems that he's been fighting about, these social problems and political problems, are all well and good, but they don't address what he called the incompleteness of the human being. It was almost a religious sense that he got from the artwork. And then he went back to, to Beijing at the time when the movement was heating up and began to preach what seemed uncharacteristic. He began to, that was when he first used his phrase, no hatred, no enemies. Manemies was looking back on his youth and seeing that all we did during the Cultural Revolution was fight, 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 fight. There had to be an evil this and a bad that. And 
no enemies, no hatred, was what he counseled the students to do, although was disappointed that they didn't listen very well and had their own uh, sort of autonomous authoritarianism in their own relations with each others. After the massacre, as Louisa mentioned, I think, he became uh, mortified that he had gone to the friend, to an Australian diplomat's friend for refuge, while others, mostly workers, stayed on the roads and tried to help others, and some of them lost their lives for that. He felt very guilty about that. And then was arrested as a black hand behind the demonstrators and put in prison in the famous Qinzhong prison in Beijing for a year and a half, during which time he wrote a confession that later he came to regret immensely. We don't know what he said. There are no recordings or transcripts of it. We only know what he says he said. And he regrets confessing and he regrets talking too much about others in the movement, which could be viewed as selling them out. He certainly didn't mean it that way, but in any case, became felt very guilty for the rest of his life about that. Every year at the anniversary of the Tiananmen Massacre, he wrote a poem to the lost souls that, were, that, that he remembers. While he was in prison, his wife Tao Li sent him divorce papers, and he signed them. He realized he had not been good to Tao Li and uh, agreed. The story of the 90s after the massacre, we could call the taming of that wild black horse. Uh, and it had a lot to do with both of his wives. Uh, Liu Xia uh, was very loyal to him all through the 90s. Um, she was divorced, I think, in 92 or 93, but after then they started living together. And in 96, they had a big banquet with friends coming, which they viewed informally as their marriage, but they weren't legally married. So when he was arrested and sent to the labor camp uh, in 1996 in Dalian, she wanted to go visit him and bring him books, and of course he wanted that, but she couldn't because they weren't legally married. So they did it. They filled out forms at the labor camp and got officially married, and still she wasn't allowed to see him. It took about a year and a half until she could actually see him as she was bringing him books, where he continued to read and to read and to begin to write poetry. His best poetry is from those uh, three years in the labor camp. All of his poems, or nearly all, were written to Xia or for my wife. And he had this sort of mystical turn. Here's where the Zhuangzi thread picks up again. He'd always had this kind of sense of a transcendent other place. And he wrote a poem about Simone Weil, the mystic French philosopher, and also about Jesus Christ and St. Augustine and others. He never embraced any religion, despite the urging of some of his Christian friends. Uh, and uh, where should I pick up here? To this, he, he wanted, he, he criticized Lu Xun, the famous, uh, early 20th century Chinese writer who was so eloquent about social injustice and cruelty and so on, but he said Lu Xun could not struggle with the dark and failed to find any transcendental, transcendental values to help him continue. When he was out of the labor camp in 2000, he published an extended dialogue with his friend Wang Shuo, who was famous as a sarcastic popular fiction writer. Uh, and Liu Tu in the dialogue was a master of sarcasm, but occasionally would change register, stand back, and chide his friend for his disregard of so-called ultimate concerns and transcendent questions. He wrote in that same year a, le a letter to his friend, the writer Liao Yiwu, where he reflected that China lacked a moral giant. We don't have a Václav Havel someone who could put ultimate principle first at whatever personal cost. Now, I won't go into everything he wrote in the period 1999 to 2008. It's in this book, which I recommend. It's an eloquent book because of him, not because of me. But they're writing on Confucius, on Kant, on St. Augustine, farmers in Jiangsu, Olympic athletes, 
Humor in China and Czechoslovakia compared pornography and politics, the internet revolution, Barack Obama's election, a murdered puppy, international relations, the Dalai Lama, China's economic miracle, and much more. Amazing range and erudition within the range. Is, this is really his mature contribution to the world, I think. He did it while it was under constant surveillance and harassment by police. There were often police cars parked at his door, and yet he went out to support per petitioners and others who were being treated unfairly in the city. He visited the Tiananmen mothers often, organized public statements, most notably, of course, Charter 08. And this is a distinctive feature about him. Most dissident so-called Chinese intellectuals at that time either went abroad or if they were in China, were didiao, just didn't talk a lot or write a lot outside. They wrote at home. He combined writing and activism, and I don't know anybody who can possibly compare with him in that regard. Um, his three contributions, in my view, that we can consider today is, are one, Charter 08 and he opened a th new third alternative for Chinese people to think about. Before, all the liberal-minded Chinese intellectuals rooted for the liberal wing within the party, and then there was the you know, behemoth conservative wing within the party and the seesaw back and forth between those two poles was the name of political thinking. Charter 08 puts that aside, transcends that, if you will, and says, no, there's a third way to think about being Chinese in the 21st century. Uh, Secondly, he shows how a person can stand on principle, I don't need to repeat this, to continue to be active under intense repression and therefore I think should be compared to people like Nelson Mandela and Václav Havel, uh, Andrei Sakharov, Ansan Suu Kyi, and others. Uh, and finally, and I know Carl has spoken about this too, but uh, I think his third warning to us now here is about the role of the rising Communist Party in the world. I'll quote here from a 2006 essay. This sounds prescient, written in 2006. If the communists succeed once again in leading China down a disastrously mistaken historical road, the results will not only be another catastrophe for the Chinese people, but likely also a disaster for the spread of liberal democracy in the world. Thank you. I, I, uh, I apologize to our last three speakers because so far people have gone beyond their 10 minutes that they were allotted. So I'm going to urge them to try to stick to 10 minutes so that we might have a little bit of time for discussion at the end. Xiao. Um, Perry said a lot of uh, I, I wanted to say, which is about Liu Xiaobo's personal transition or transformation. Uh, I only speak with, spoke with him once on the phone uh, in early 20, 2000. But I know of him not only since uh, 90s when he was a political prisoner in the Tiananmen, I was doing human rights work, uh, even before when he was uh, the black horse, uh, denouncing every single famo famous name in China, that especially liberal intellectuals, including my mentor, Fang Lijiu. Um, and I always know him as an egomaniac. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's not quite my taste. I was moved by his decision to return to China and uh, 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 be with students, not only that, and what he did on Tiananmen Square. But uh, once again, I was completely disgusted by his own uh, confession and his, uh, his, his, his biograph some kind of biographical memoir after that he published in Taiwan, uh, full of ego and full of confusion. Uh, uh, to me, uh, uh, he wasn't someone I wanted to talk to. Until, and later on, I also heard that uh, he was out of prison and once he was visiting Tiananmen mother, Ding Ziling, Ding Ziling didn't want to see him for the same reason. 
But since he was back uh, in, 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 the, in, in the labor camp the second time and came out, his writing changes, his tone changes. He became humble. He's transformed. I have never known what. I worked with dissidents, democracy ac activists, advocates, all these heroes in my life. Some, and lots of them are very egoistic. But someone went through that kind of transition, become humble, become, as, 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 as Perry eloquently said, you know, concerned about the transcendent value. Liu Xiaobo was the only one I always asked, what made him change? What made him humble? What transformed him? What made him from a, a egotistic, a, a flawed human being to a true not only a democratic advocate, not a writer, someone with conscience and humbleness and spiritual inspiration. This is all before 2000. I thought maybe it's love, because his poetry from Liu Xia means a lot. And I asked other people, uh, some friend, no, people knows him said, oh, in, in prison, he, in the second time in the labor camp, he read, he read a lot. He read Tostoyevsky. And someone else told me, it's all because Ding Ziling didn't want to see him. Because it's June 4th. It's the Tiananmen. It's people's life made him humble, transformed him. It's only something like that has that kind of spiritual transformative power make an individual to rise above himself to something greater. And Liu Xiaobo, became someone greater, even greater than many others in the same moment. And today, to me, he was not rest of his history after that personal transition. Today, to me, he was not only a true hero, a hero for democracy. He's more than a hero. Uh, you know, he's not religious, I'm not religious, I don't know what word. He's a saint. He has a spiritual inspiration that no hatred, no enemy, that kind of transcendent value is a beyond of current or the reality or even you know, for the political reality and, and, and the efforts, any foreseeable future. Secondly, it's most, most, most needed most desperately needed. Uh, Carl wants me to talk about how the Chinese society view him, Chinese people view him. People view him as, as all these things, uh, and, and, and a majority of people doesn't want to know him, they don't know him. They don't need to know him, they don't want to know him. But spirit of Liu Xiaobo, he's more than a sample of an activist, a writer, even a poet. He has this reach this spiritual guidance, which is mostly, mostly, mostly needed for China's in coming years, for its own transformation. How China, as a society, can go through a transformation from a violence, from eye to eye, from hatred to hatred, to a peaceful, above hatred, above enemy. That state, I don't know, but Liu Xiaobo is a star out there. So I'm just gonna read uh, a short uh, a piece I wrote for CNN during uh, the day uh, Liu Xiaobo died. I only read the last paragraph. Uh, uh, Someday, Liu's name will grace a national monument of a democratic China for transcending fear with love in advance of human dignity. One day, when nations become absolute concepts and the national monuments disappears from the earth, the name Liu Xiaobo, together with those Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and Nelson Mandela, will still be as bright as the brightest stars in the night sky, inspiring the ever-enduring enterprises of human freedom and dignity. Meanwhile, 
the names of those who imprisoned him and hastened his death, together with the name of the brutal and brief authoritarian regime, will be only a mere footnote under Liu Xiaobo's page in the history book. Yet many tens of years um, since July 13th, um, we um, had not had a chance like this to be together, share our profound sense of loss, our grief, and pain. Uh, many inside China who try to hold uh, memorial services uh, for Liu Xiaobo have been detained or placed under a gag rule. His wife, Liu Xia, has been practically put under enforced disappearance. Um, we also need uh, a meeting of the mind like this to ask us the hard questions about the future of a democracy in China, including questions like, how can we stop the Chinese government from getting away once again, for persecuting a peaceful critic to death, adding to the growing list of uh, prisoners of conscience who died in police custody, like Liu Xiaobo, like Cao Zhenli, or Gu Xiu Lapsang, or Pan Mingming? How could we end the now 30-year-long stretch of impunity for those who are responsible for the 1989 Tiananmen Massacre. Many in the community feel anguished, asking where do we see any hope in the seemingly endless tunnel of darkness. Twenty years before his last imprisonment, the Chinese government had banned Liu Xiaobo's writings from being printed or circulated on the internet in China. But why then the leaders of that government, which has since become a superpower, remain so terrified of him such that they're not satisfied with merely having him silenced such that they want to obliterate him, even leaving no trace of him. Awarding Liu Xiaobo the 2010 Nobel Peace Prize confers him the moral giant that he lamented China didn't have. It's the world's highest moral standing. It confirms the nonviolent advocacy for promoting democracy and the human rights that he envisioned and practiced. It also nailed the so-called China model as on the wrong side of human history. The so-called model of modernizing a country's economy without democratization and human rights. It claims, that model claims that the um, 13 billion Chinese only desire materialistic stability and care nothing for liberty. So the, um, what I'm trying to say is the hatred that the government uh, harbored towards Liu Xiaobo and what he stands for needs an explanation and I'm, I'm trying to do it um, in a way to um, fulfill my obligation today here of the assignment that Andy and Carl uh, imposed, which I think is, is too big a topic for uh, 10 minutes, 
and I think all of you here and the many more, uh, we all share that responsibility to, to figure out. Uh, but I'm gonna offer my uh, two pennies. Um, when uh, a season, the China scholar heard the breaking news in Beijing of that year's Nobel Peace Prize going to Liu Xiaobo, he, he broke down in sobbing. A friend asked, why? Shouldn't you be smiling and celebrating? The scholar replied, and he wrote later, at that moment, I knew Liu Xiaobo would never walk out of that prison alive. It, it is clear that it was the activist Liu Xiaobo, in addition to the writer, the poet Liu Xiaobo. It's the peaceful actions he took in sowing the seeds for democratic change that terrified China's authoritarian leaders. I had known about uh, Liu Xiaobo through his many writings many years before I got to know him, had conversations with him, worked with him uh, in his head as an activist with a vision. Between 2004 and 2008, with a circle of like-minded friends, um, we had frequent communications about organizing, supporting, and taking actions for peaceful change Less known to many others, he was actively involved in actions such as campaigning for prisoners of conscience, building capacity, and providing support to human rights activists and lawyers. I wrote uh, elsewhere about one conversation we had the day before police detained him in Beijing in that December 2008. Uh, he discussed the use of a few words in one of the last drafts of Charter 8, which is a constitutional reform manifesto that was to be made public on December 10th, which is the 60th International Human Rights Day. He told me how he had just collected one more signature from a reformer, a former government official who lived under police surveillance uh, he said, do you know how I did it? I showed up at 5 a.m. in a park in Beijing where the old man practiced Tai Chi with the police around him. I walked up to him, pra uh, pretend I was practicing Tai Chi, and then in the midst of the cover of the, fo the fog, I was able to show him Charter 08. And Charter 08 called for respect for basic universal values, including freedom, human rights, equality, democracy, and constitutional rule. By that time, more than 300 Chinese activists, lawyers, and liberal intellectuals had uh, added their signatures to endorse it. Liu Xiaobo worked tirelessly to collect those signatures by email, by Skype, or playing badminton, or at dinner parties, or going to the park at 5 a.m. I worried about the serious consequences, the risks. I wanted to suggest the delaying the release of the document. What's your worry? He disagreed. The worst for me, he said, is going back to jail. But it's worth it. It has been 20 years, do you know, since Tiananmen, but there has been no justice. I'll do everything. He was ready. It is the vision that Liu Xiaobo and his friends um, drew up in Charter 08. It's the peaceful actions to bring it about. The actions that he advocated, he sought to support. The actions that could improve the lives and expand freedom to individuals living under the repressive regime. It is that strategically nonviolent and potentially popular approach that had terrified 
and brought Liu Xiaobo the wrath of the Chinese authoritarian leaders. These leaders should be afraid. This approach, as Liu Xiaobo envisioned it, transcending fear with love and fighting for freedom peacefully with optimism, continues to inspire new generations of uh, democracy and human rights activists today. It lives on in the rights lawyers' stubborn insistence on their clients' legal rights, or in the new citizens' movements' demand that top officials disclose their personal income, or in the petitioners' determination to band together to lodge grievances and seek justice. And in many citizens' uh, calls to want to hold the government accountable for its own promises made in the country's constitution and in the many international human rights treaties it has ratified. Many more Chinese today than in 1989 or 2008, I stand to be corrected, are taking piecemeal and peaceful actions to defend human rights, build the foundation for democracy and rule of law. I have met many college graduates working in nonprofit groups advocating for the rights of the disabled, LGBTQ victims of sexual violence. There are Chinese groups training common folks inside the country to use the law to bring officials to court to seek compensation for lost housing or for black lungs infected from working in coal mines or pouring concrete. The projects that Liu Xiaobo helped ushering into existence, have since grown and produced the fruits. One lawyer who attended training in International Convention on Women's Rights assisted a villager to sue her village officials and own the case involving gender discrimination in land use. Another lawyer filed an appeal to the UN alleging arbitrary detention of his client who was locked up at a labor camp without a trial. Officials later told the lawyer that a UN inquiry about the case had led to the client's early release. A school teacher who was among the first group who signed the Charter 08 has organized the local election monitoring and become an expert on basic level election laws. His group has trained hundreds of Chinese online about free and fair elections. The Chinese government's suppression of such efforts at challenging its authoritarian rule and fighting human rights abuses were likely to intensify in the coming months and years. Those of us committed to support democracy and human rights must keep up and strengthen our support to such grassroots peaceful activism that has persevered inside the country, making real differences over time. That is where the hope lives, and that is really the best we can do to keep our memory of Liu Xiaobo alive. Thank you. I wanted to follow up on a point that Xiao Rong has raised, which is what the regime is so afraid of, and this paradox of the regime's strength and weaknesses. The, the way that they treated Liu Xiaobo showed us their, uh, in a sense, their strength, their determination, and their ability to uh, get away with really vicious repression, starting with, well, just not to go all the way back to where Perry went back to, but starting with the 11-year prison sentence for 
Charter 08, Charter 08 being, as Xiao Rong says, a constitutional manifesto asking the regime to implement its own constitution. And for that, a person is given an 11-year sentence. It's excessive. I mean, any sentence is excessive, and 11 years is a very long one. And then secondly, to imprison his wife in a completely illegal house arrest with no legal justification at all and isolate her in that house arrest so that she suffered for all those many years from severe depression. Uh, she suffered very badly. Then to allow him uh, to go without medical, without diagnosis and medical treatment in prison until his illness was ir irretrievable and then to bring him out and use him as a propaganda tool, uh, cynically providing this high-end medical care at the very end when it was no longer useful and videoing that and circulating it as propaganda. Um, and then, as uh, Xiao Rong alluded to, cremating the body and forcing his wife to scatter the ashes and now disappearing her, as far as I know, she hasn't reappeared. These are acts of, uh, of, of great cruelty, but also tremendous determination and a certain kind of strength in that sense of the ability to do and get away with these things and to get away with it internationally as well, to punish the government of Norway for having been the place where there's a committee that gave him a prize and punishing them diplomatically and economically and no other government daring to do anything about it. And it's interesting that the way they treated him, he is the most famous person to have been treated this way, but by no means the only person to be treated this way. Many, many people are treated this way uh, to give, uh, in terms of the excessive sentencing of people for really doing nothing. As Carl mentioned, I wanted to bring up the case of Xu Zhiyong, who uh, was the organizer of something called the New Citizens Movement, which was very, very peaceful and very legal and very idealistic. And Xu Zhiyong was sentenced to four years for that. And he is just his sentence has just ended, and presumably he has been released, but he also has, so far as I know, just disappeared after he made one statement. I don't know what about it. So, you know, and so uh, that is excessive. And you all remember that the rights protection lawyers, again, dedicated to the law and to peaceful uh, pursuit of protecting citizens, um, the widespread arrests of those people, disbarring of those people, releases of some under control, some still uh, detained. The feminist activists, just uh, uh, two weeks ago, I think, a, a poet uh, whose pen name is Langza was uh, detained for publishing poems in the honor of Liu Xiaobo and his, uh, one, one of the people who printed those poems has been detained. So the idea of just uh, grabbing people for no reason is, uh, is uh, something that the regime does over and over again. And mistreating people in prison is also extremely common and people dying in prison. So I think, uh, who mentions Hao Shun Li? I think Xiao Rong also mentioned her, a person who died in detention in 2014 when she was um, about to leave. She was detained when she was about to leave China to come to Geneva to testify before the UN Human Rights Council, the Tibetan monk Tenzin Delek Rinpoche, who died in 2015 in prison, having been mistreated. Um, the, we have a lot of cases right now of uh, people's relatives saying that they are ill in prison, Guo Feixiong, a lawyer, uh, uh, and that they're not getting appropriate medical treatment. And although the pr conditions in Chinese prisons are generally bad, but it's pretty clear that the political prisoners are targeted out for uh, a kind of assassination. I mean, in some cases, it really is the intent to, to find a way to get that person to be dead. Why? But the regime looks so strong. It has the strength, the apparatus, and the international 
power to do these things, and it's now in a very triumphalist phase. The economic growth rate continues on at about 6.7 or maybe at 6.9 percent, despite, you know, financial issues and problems in the economy that some economists are predicting they're going to collapse sooner or later. They're still maintaining this high growth rate. They have over $3 trillion worth of foreign exchange, which they're investing in you know, the one belt, one road, and also in uh, supporting friendly politicians in Australia and uh, Greece and uh, Cambridge University Press um, and all kinds of places. They, they're heading into this 19th Party Congress, which is supposed to open on October 18th, and by all appearances, there's a complete, uh, you would think, it's po politics is politics, and you would think there would be some political struggle, but my best assessment is that there really is a complete now unification of the party elite around the one-man dictatorship of Xi Jinping and a disappearance of collective leadership, the sort of division of power that occurred under Hu Jintao and a a thing where Xi Jinping decides everything and everybody else is number two to him. So this is, again, looking very, very strong domestically, internationally, economically, politically. So what are they afraid of then, as Xiaorong appropriately asked? Well, my sense of that is that the regime leadership is very much remembering Tiananmen remembering that after Tiananmen, the Soviet Union surprisingly fell apart, remembering that from time to time they've confronted riots, uh, as they call them, perhaps I shouldn't, but civil disorder in Tibet, in Xinjiang, in various villages around the country. They're, they're aware of all the activity that Xiaorong mentioned of small people doing small things and trying to pursue individual justice. They remember the umbrella movement in Hong Kong, the sunflower movement in Taiwan. And the conclusion that they draw from all these things is that political order or political strength is fragile and vulnerable. And why is it fragile and vulnerable? Why should it be? And I think there's a kind of uh, core reason for that in this type of a system, a structural reason, which is that this is a system that's ruled by a vanguard political party that consists of 6% of the population, approximately the Chinese Communist Party. 94% of the population are not part of that party by definition. It's a vanguard party. It's not a party that everybody can join. It's a selected party of membership. You have to be selected and you have to be indoctrinated and you have to continuously be indoctrinated and show loyalty and obedience to be a member of that party. And that party doesn't trust anybody outside the party. I had an interesting conversation recently with a youngish person who's rising up in that political party and, and we talked about this very frankly and he said we don't trust the people to vote. I mean, he he scored a big point on me by saying, look what happens in your country when the people vote. I, I wasn't able to contradict him. But, um, you know, the, that's their point, you know, and it's always been their point is that we don't want to let the people vote because the people are not politically mature, you know, and they're backward, and so they need to be led. And I said to him, well, you don't have to trust the people to vote, but don't you want to trust your own media workers, the journalists, to, you know, to write about things that they discover that are going wrong. And he says, we don't really trust the media workers either because they have their own interests and they don't understand things fully unless they're party members. Of course, those who are party members, we, we try to trust them to run the media. And I said, well, what about the courts? Can you trust the courts? No, we can only, we can trust the courts to determine, you know, different economic issues, but when it comes to sensitive political issues, the party has to guide the courts. Um, so what about the party members? Do you trust them? Well, not entirely. No, we can't really trust <laughs> our party members because many of them are corrupt, many of them are abusive, many of them are ambitious, many of them have joined the party opportunistically. 
the logic of that is, is very real. I think if you're inside that mentality, it perfectly makes sense. But it means that uh, uh, most people are on the outside. And I said, well, then who's going to supervise the party? And he said, well, that's very clear. The party supervises itself. That's how the system works. And as a consequence, they, they cannot relinquish the control that they've accumulated. There's a saying in Chinese security work that you can't show a soft hand because the enemies of the party will take advantage of that, as happened in 1989 in their view. And Mao had a f phrase when he was making revolution, Xinhua Liaoyuan, a single spark can start a prairie fire. And they fear that a single spark that might be lit by one of the people Xiao Rong is talking about would, could start a conflagration against the party. So as Perry has said and, uh, and Xiao has said so well that Liu Xiaobo came to a kind of spiritual insight that he had no enemies. The Vanguard Party is a, a system that ha produces and needs and assumes the presence of many, many enemies. That's the situation of that party, and I think that that's what the treatment of Liu Xiaobo shows us about the inner psychology and inner ideology of the ruling party. Thanks, Andy, for, for, for pulling it all together in that way, fascinating way. It's a little bit late. We have lunch waiting outside, but we're going to take one round of three questions and then let the speakers respond to what they want to respond to uh, or respond to each other, uh, and, then we'll, and then we'll break and have lunch. So three, uh, three questions. Let me see, and, and please identify yourself. Let me just give people a moment so I can see some hands. I see one right here. I see a second there. Maybe just two. Okay, one and two. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, there'll be a mic. Can somebody provide a handheld mic here? I see them over there. Maybe somebody can grab those mics and somebody can give a mic to the... You got to turn it on. You got to turn it on. Just take them, uh, push the button. Push the button. Okay. It'll come on. If, the, if you go, go ahead. So make sure you push the button up. Ah, okay, there we go. Okay. Uh, my name's Arnold Zeitlin. I've been teaching in Guangzhou for many years. Um, the question is, you have a uh, totalitarian uh, one-party police state that happens to be the elephant in the room as far as international affairs are concerned. So what, what do you do about that? Okay, that's great. All right. <laughs> That's nice and short too. And 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 the question and the question over there. I saw a hand there. 好，呃，我的问题是，呃，因为我看诸位演讲者好像那中文说的都非常的好，那么是不是我可以用中文来提这个问题？那么 ，or should I talk,、uh, ask my question in English、um, for the audience?、Um, it's very simple.、Um, I'd like to、uh, ask if you have ignored the impact of religion in Liu Xiaobo's life in、uh, your research,、uh, although you have mentioned it. Uh, many times in your uh, uh, in your lecture、uh, just now, and、um, I guess I can only guess、um, as a non-researcher of his、uh, his life and his、uh, idea that um, um, the traditional Chinese、uh, religion impacts from Taoism, from Buddhism, as well as later in his life before his um, um, detainment and、uh, imprisonment. The Uh, not at least, or first of all, uh, in the uh, religion of Christian re uh, uh, Christian re religion may impact his thinking a lot. And although he uh, that he didn't、um, present himself as a Christian as a believer, but、uh, maybe in inside of his in of his heart, he recognized and practiced. Uh, the way of、uh, of Jesus, maybe, and maybe he is uh, uh, very 
loyal believer of uh, practicing Christian. Right. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Uh, two s short and simple questions, but the uh, speakers can uh, either answer those questions, the large questions, or you know, give some final reflections, comment on what others have said, and we'll do it in the same order in which uh, the speakers uh, made their presentations, starting with Louisa. Push the button. I, I'm not sure where his reverence for the transcendent came from. The first sign I've seen of it is his study for his MA when he wrote about Zhuangzi. Uh, he grew up in a standard communist ideology family, an atheist family, and so this was his own creation. And then, he, yes, he wrote about Christian saints and Jesus Christ himself, but didn't become a Christian. Anecdotally, I've heard that his friend Yu Jie, who's written a biography of him, who is Christian, went to him and urged him to do it, and he got shooed out of the house. No, it was very personal kind of reaching for something that's greater than ordinary human life, but he, he didn't join a religion, and he wouldn't, and he looked at the question and didn't. We, we have a certain time pressure because Andy has a speaking engagement, so we yeah, want to move it along. Reviewing his attachment to religion. I don't know about the elephant in the room. I just think events like this are step one in addressing that elephant. Xiao Chang. question. Uh, I'm not Liu Xiaobo's personal close friends. I don't know his personal aspect very closely. Oh, yeah, all, all, all I know is uh, he read Nietzsche when he was young, and he read Tostoevsky when in, he was in second time in prison, and that to me, that was a time of the transformation, so there's something to do with it. Uh, to your question, the big question, um, yes, we want a democratic China, and democratic countries doesn't go in war with others, usually, yeah, usually other democracies particularly. Uh, so that's the short answer. But I need to add one more. If China goes through the transition, or at the time near transition, which is now, it could be another 50 years, I, mean, I have no idea how long that is, it's also dangerous for a war because a authoritarian China and an internally insecure, fragile, and a vulnerable political system with its strengths, it's a real danger for the world peace. And that's why Liu Xiaobo's message of no enemy and no hatred is go beyond the border, so important to probably help to get us, guide us, China can ever go through this dangerous but necessary transformative process. To the uh, elephants uh, in the room, the, the seemingly strong and uh, superpower uh, in the world uh, today, I think we that question is put to one, everyone and each of us, are we doing enough? Because um, I, I believe uh, human rights, freedom is part of human nature. So don't believe anything that the Chinese don't care for them. They all want it. But it's dangerous for them to speak out, to, to take action now. But they are fighting for it in their own quiet way. And we all, in our different positions, as writers, as NGO workers, as the government officials, journalists, we can all do our part to uh, become the, the ants the bees to surround up the elephant 
<laughs> because it's the human nature, we want freedom, we want liberty. So, so in the long term, this is going to win because you can't suppress human nature, no matter how powerful you are. And to the religion question, I think as uh, Perry, I think was touching it, which is uh, if you have once been a communist, uh, that was a religion. So you feel, uh, Liu Xiaobo once wrote, I think uh, my friend, uh, the exile writer, Su Xiaokang, um, wrote about this, um, that transformation, because then you have this knee-jerk reaction to any kind of state religion, or any kind of authoritarian-ish religion that's being imposed on you. So I, I think Xiaobo was in that process of the transformation of his generation of liberal intellectuals and have this general attitude, which is very suspicious of elite religion. Um, the other part of this was because um, to, to fight, to come out of one religion, it's just very hard to get into another one. And, and he and I share a major in philosophy. I think you, if you studied philosophy, and which is uh, uh, you know, Socrates, who was the first philosopher whose famous saying, what is philosophy, is to question everything. So I, I think that uh, probably is where the answer to your question is. On the elephant in the room question, I don't, I think it's too late to stop the rise of China. I mean, things may happen there, but we won't make them happen. I, I don't share Steve Bannon's view that, you know, you can still stop China from rising. Uh, it's there. We have to live with it. We might not like everything, but I think we have to pick our best. The rise of China is not 100 percent a bad thing. There, there are many ways in which it is or can be a good thing. But we have to pick our battles, which are important. And I think one of the most important battles is the, what Xiao Rong just alluded to, which is the fate of our various freedoms in the world. I think especially when China exerts its influence on the politics or academic life or publishing life of, uh, that we lead here, this is a, a, a battle that we have to fight very hard. Um, and we should certainly continue to support those in China who are fighting for their own freedoms. That's one of the important areas for us to work. Thanks so much, Andy, and thanks uh, to everyone. Um, obviously, the issue before us is not just the rise of China, but can it achieve a kind of transformation similar to the transformation that Lu Xiaobo underwent and that uh, uh, Xiao Chang and, and the other speakers have uh, described so well. It's, and, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of focus on Russia in Washington today, but, you know, what happens in China is ultimately much more important for the future of the world. And uh, we, uh, we can only think about Liu Xiaobo and his own transformation as we try to encourage a similar transformation in China on which uh, the peace of the world depends. Thank you all for coming. We have lunch outside. Thank you.